A lot of people have been asking me to continue this series on my YouTube channel and I've been having a really hectic two weeks and I hadn't gone around to actually do the episode. But here we go. Grab a piece of paper and let's go. Hello and welcome to the Atomic Bomb Season 1 Episode 2. This is the series on my YouTube channel where we look at four different courses in preparation for those that are about to take the licensure exam. If you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, please hit the subscribe button, hit the bell notification icon to be receiving notifications of such videos every time I post. Tell a friend to tell a friend that we are revising content on the channel and learning new topics. Subscribe if you haven't. Hit the like button, hit the bell notification icon to be receiving notifications of such amazing contents every time I post. Grab a piece of paper and let's jump right in. There are four chapters in this. Chapter one is internal medicine. You may pause the video at any point, write down your answer, scream it at the screen, tell a friend if you're watching them with a friend, and let's go. So question one, a patient comes in with a history of product, a cough, which is productive for more than three weeks, and a history of weight loss. Take a relevant history. What is your diagnosis? What test will you do? How would you treat extrapulmonary TB? What are the side effects of the TB drugs? You may pause the video right now. And here comes the answer. So when you're taking the history, remember that you just imagine that you're in the casualty setup. You are taking a relevant history. You don't have enough time to take history, a full history. So the important things. Demographics, what is important for the patient? Are we told about the age or not? So the age has a very good bearing because very young, very old, susceptible. And if they are of an age that you don't expect TB to be present, then you start to think of other things like immunosuppression. Are, are there any associated night sweats, which is associated with TB? Anorexia? Is there any fever? Is there any chest pains? Okay. And is there TB contact? Is anyone at home who has been having active TB? Have they been treated for it? How was it diagnosed? What's the past medical history? Is there any past medical history of TB? Is this the first episode? Then do they have a history of HIV? And are they on any long-term corticosteroid use or do they have diabetes? Things that can affect the immune system. So your diagnosis here is most likely pulmonary tuberculosis because this person has a productive cough for more than three weeks and as well as weight loss, which are base symptoms that are associated with TB. In our setting, this is the most common cause. So you want to get sputum because it's productive cough for microscopic culture sensitivity. You also want to get sputum for gene expert. You want to get sputum for an AFB or a ZN stain, which is your modified Zeonielsen stain. You want to get a chest x-ray. You want to do a retroviral test. You also want to get urine lamb. Then if it's extra pulmonary TB, remember that all forms of complicated TB, we now treat them for one year, that's 12 months, divided into two months, which is known as the initiation phase, and 10 months, which is known as the continuation phase. So in the initiation phase, we're going to be using rifampicin, isoniazide, pyrazinamide, and ethambutol, four drugs. Then in the continuation phase, we use two drugs, rifampicin and isoniazide. Then of course, we're going to add steroids in treatment of TB pericarditis, TB meningitis, as well as TB osteomyelitis. Now here are the side effects. Four main drugs, rifampicin, isoniazide, pyrazinamide, and ethambutol. So you can remember RIPE as a mnemonic. So I'll just point out the ones that you should know. So rifampicin is hepatotoxic. It's an inducer of cytochrome P450. That's the major side effect. The minor side effect is that it causes discoloration of the body fluids, orange, pinkish, sometimes reddish discoloration. Then with isoniazide, it's also hepatotoxic and it causes peripheral neuropathy as a a minor side effect. So we often tend to give this with vitamin B6. Then pyrazinamide cause is hepatotoxic. It's I think the most hepatotoxic of the three. And the minor side effects, it causes hyperuricemia, so it can exacerbate gout. Then ethambutol causes optic neuritis, which can lead to visual impairment. And then of course, um, not so many minor side effects. So usually it's the major side effect of affecting the visual acuity. There was at one point where we actually weren't even giving ethambutol in children. Then coming to question two, 
These are the questions that you find at the station. What are the causes of polyuria? What questions would you ask a diabetic patient? How would you ensure the sugars are controlled? What end organ damage would you examine for? A diabetic patient presents with palpitations. What would possibly be the cause? You may pause the video right now. Here comes the answer. So causes of polyuria, you have uh, conditions like diabetes mellitus, diabetes insipidus. These are two different conditions. Urinary tract infections, pregnancy, renal failure, Cushing syndrome, hypercalcemia, even liver disease. What questions you would ask a diabetic patient? So you would want to ask for a history of recurrent thrush, whether oral or genital. You want to ask for a history of weight loss, a history of abdominal pains, vomiting and diarrhea, which could point towards diabetic ketoacidosis. You want to ask about a history of fever or chest pains or a cough, which is usually pointing towards infections. You want to ask for their compliance to the treatment. What type of treatment are they on? Is it insulin? Is it tablets? Then you also want to ask a history of excessive urination, changes in vision, which is a complication of diabetes. Then how would you ensure that the sugars are controlled? So first of all, you want to counsel this patient. Adherence and counseling, very, very simple. The second thing that you want to do is you simplify their insulin regimens there. You give them a simple regimen to follow. Instead of doing a lot of calculations and giving them a lot of different types of insulins that they inject at different types of types, you can actually give them the pre-mixed insulin so that they can actually give themselves twice a day in the morning and at night. This helps with adherence. Then you may also counsel them on their diet, counsel them on their lifestyle modifications such as cessation of alcohol and as well as smoking, regular exercise to keep their BMI within the stipulated range, weight loss. Then of course an RBS profile at home and as of course you can monitor the hemoglobin A1c which is your glycated hemoglobin. Then what end organ damage would you examine for? So from head to toe, you examine the eyes for any cataracts, you examine the limbs for any diabetic foot, any loss of sensation. So you want to check for proprioception, you want to check your peripheral pulses in the cases of peripheral vascular disease. Then if a diabetic patient actually has palpitations, it's most likely this patient could either have an arrhythmia, most likely an atrial fibrillation, or more commonly remember that diabetes is associated with atherosclerosis, which can affect the coronary artery, so they may actually have a coronary artery disease. Moving on to question three, a patient with chronic liver disease comes bleeding. What are the causes? What is the pathophysiology of esophageal viruses? How would you manage? You may pause the video at this particular moment. And here comes the answer. So remember that someone with chronic liver disease and they come in bleeding, it could obviously be esophageal viruses as one of the differential diagnoses. It could be a Mallory Weiss tear, which happens in the background of someone having gone for a binge drink and then they excessively vomit and then this leads to tears in the GIT, especially the uh, near the lower esophageal sphincter. Then Bohaf syndrome is where these complete rupture of the esophagus. So remember that in esophageal virus, the main problem here is that you have portal hypertension because the liver is roast. Because remember, all the blood that's coming from the GIT is supposed to first drain through the liver through the hepatic portal vein, then it's eventually supposed to be draining through the hepatic veins into the inferior vena cava. So the, the liver is fibrosed, so blood can flow into the liver effectively. So even the pressure is somewhere around 10 to 15 millimeters of mercury. So what will happen is that this blood will now pass through these collateral circulations that are found at the gastroesophageal junction and these vessels are actually quite superficial and they tend to distend and they can actually rupture and this can lead to bleeding. That's the underlying pathophysiology behind esophageal viruses. Now generally how do we manage these patients? We generally want to admit them so you want to stabilize them. This is very important. You keep them near per oral Remember, this is an emergency, so your ABCs ensure that your airway is patent, the patient is breathing, gain venous access with two large bulk cannulae, give them oxygen, check their saturations. Then, of course, if the patient is in shock, you want to give them a bolus of IV fluids. And then that's your fluid of choice being normal saline. If you don't have normal saline, Ringer's lactate can also work. Then, of course, you cross-match this patient, and your goal is that you want to get your hematocrit about 25 to about 30 percent or above in older patients and those that have coronary artery disease then of course you also if they're actively bleeding you check for the platelets if their platelets are less than 50,000 then if there's an impaired uh, function such as a uremia 
aspirin that is impairing the function of the platelets, transfuse them with platelets or give them desmopressin. Then of course, if there's active bleeding and the prothrombin time is increased and the INRA is greater than 1.5, transfuse them with fresh frozen plasma, put a foldis catheter to monitor your urine input output. And then of course, you're going to have to do these hourly measurements of the pulse, hourly measurements of the blood pressure and the urine output. Generally, our medical treatment or definitive treatment, you want to give this person actually high dose of IV proton pump inhibitors upon the presentation. We generally want to give these as IV initially, especially if they're actively bleeding. You don't want to give them as oral, you want to give them as IV. So you can actually give your esomeprazole, which is given IV, 40 milligrams twice a day. Then after that, you have given your proton pump inhibitors. Remember, this is going to actually reduce the risk of them continuing bleeding and uh, more damage. So you can actually institute an IV proton pump inhibitor pump or drip, which is at 8 milligrams per hour for 72 hours if they do an esophageal gastroduodenoscopy and it shows that there's a high risk of them re-bleeding. You can put them on an infusion of the proton pump inhibitor. Generally, you want to give your IV octreotide for suspected variceal hemorrhage for three days if it's verified by your OGD, your esophageal gastroduodenoscopy. Then this is actually has been shown to decrease portal hypertension. Though Vitamin K rarely helps. You may also give vitamin K, your 5 milligrams IM stat. Propranolol actually should be get used in the long run. And when the patient is acutely decompensated, you wouldn't want to put them on propranolol unless if they're hemodynamically stable. Then you cover them on broad spectrum antibiotics if there is suspected liver disease to prevent them from going into hepatic encephalopathy. And once the patient is stabilized, actually make sure that you do an endoscopy. And this endoscopy is both diagnostic and it can also be used as a therapeutic modality where you can use it for banding, you can use it for thermal coagulation, you can use it for sclerosant application, you can use it for epinephrine and even electrocautery. And of course, if they continue bleeding, they actually need an esophageal balloon tamponade. And this is actually going to be a pre-procedure for actually a surgical procedure, which is known as a transjugular intrahepatic potosystemic shunting. Moving on to question four, what would you do in severe asthmatic attacks if the patient has a silent chest or is unable to inhale? This one here is a very, very important question because you're going to get asthmatic patients at one point in your career. So what are you going to do? Someone comes in, they're asthmatic and the chest is silent. What exactly are you going to do? So here comes the answer. So first of all, remember this is an emergency. So your ABCs again. You check that the airway is patent, you check that the patient is breathing, you cannulate the patient, gain venous access to large bowel cannulae. Generally, someone that comes in with a severe asthmatic attack, life-threatening attack, it's direct that they have to be admitted in the ICU. So you have to prepare them for possible intubation. You, of course, give them your bronchodilators. And in this case, you're not going to be giving it as nebulized because the chest is already silent. They're not taking in anything. If you can actually give it once they are, they are intubated, but... Ideally, you want to give IV salbutamol if it's available. Otherwise, aminophidine can be given, though with this, the it has a narrow therapeutic index and it can actually per, uh, perpetuate arrhythmia. So we generally tend to avoid it, especially in the older individuals. Though in, in the neonates, we actually do give this, especially the premature neonates. Coming to question five, when performing advanced life support, what is the ratio of compressions if you are performing them alone versus with an assistant? How many compressions will you do in a minute? So there's actually a song for compressions, for doing chest compressions. And I want you guys to actually look this up. It's um, Staying Alive. I think the song should be Staying Alive. Just go on YouTube and search Staying Alive. I don't know if it's staying alive or keeping alive. It has a very, very catchy tune. And you can actually sing that song in your head and move into the beat according to the chest compressions. And you, you actually continue doing them at a specific rate. But here comes the answer. So if you're alone, you can do 30 chest compressions followed by two rescue breaths. If you're with an assistant, 15 chest compressions followed by one rescue breath. Remember that now if you actually don't have an assistant, just the chest compressions enough. If they're done adequately, they can actually be enough to save a patient. Then generally you want to aim to do at least 100 compressions in a minute. So you aim for between 100 to 120. This is an adult's. Moving on to chapter two, which is surgery. Question one, define acute abdomen. What conditions present with acute abdomen? What investigations would you do and what would you expect to find? You may pause the video and here comes the answer. So 
Remember that acute abdomen is just pretty much an, an abrupt onset of abdominal pain, which is usually accompanied by one of the following peritoneal signs. There is either rigidity, tenderness, which may be with or without rebound tenderness, and involuntary guarding. So there are different conditions that are grouped according to where exactly on the abdomen the patient is feeling the pain, whether it's in the right upper quadrant, the left upper quadrant, the right lower quadrant, the left lower quadrant, and even the periambilical region. Here's a picture to help you this. So if it's in the right upper quadrant, it could be a perforated duodenal ulcer, acute cholecystitis, hepatic abscess, retrocecal appendicitis, even appendicitis in pregnant women. If it's in the right lower quadrant, appendicitis, cecal diverticulitis, Meckel's diverticulitis into susception. Very common in children. If it's on the left lower quadrant, sigmoid diverticulitis, sigmoid volvulus. If it's the left upper quadrant, it could be a splenic rupture, splenic abscess. If it's diffuse all over the abdomen, it could be bowel obstruction, it could be a leaking aneurysm, it could be mesenteric ischemia. If it's periambilical, it could be an early appendicitis, it could be pain from small bowel obstruction. If it's suprapubic, it could be an ectopic pregnancy, ovarian torsion, it could be a tubal ovarian abscess, psoas abscess, and even an incarcerated groin hernia. These are the different types of conditions that may present you with an acute abdomen. Or of course, here's a picture to actually add even much more of the conditions to the diagram. So coming back, what investigations would you do and what would you expect to find? So you want to do x-rays. So you want to get a chest x-ray, an erect PA chest x-ray and you want to get an abdominal x-ray pretty much an erect and supine so here you're going to be looking on the erect x-rays you're going to be looking for free air under the diaphragm so this can actually be detecting as little as even one to two mils of air under the right hemidaphragm remember that on the left side you have the gastric bubble which can often obscure the air under the diaphragm and also on the x-rays, the erect x-rays on the abdomen, you actually want to look for air fluid levels as well as distended bulbs that can be seen on the supine abdominal x-rays. I'll show you what these look like in a few slides coming up. Then an abdominal ultrasound can be done which may show distended bowel loops. A grave index should be done to rule out pregnancy. It, it can be positive if someone has an ectop ectopic pregnancy. Echocardiograph to rule out any myocardial infarction. You may see ST. STT changes, ST segment elevation or depression with invasion of the T waves. Then UNE's creatinine may be raised, which may be an indication of dehydration, hemoconcentration. So this may also be pointing towards acute kidney injury. Serum amylase and lipase tend to be raised in acute pancreatitis. And of course, a full blood count with a differential to rule out any infectious things like acute cholecystitis. This is the picture once again. You may pause the video, get a screenshot of this to help you remember the different things that may present with acute abdomen. So here is a picture of an erect x-ray. As you can see here, there is air under the diaphragm. This is known as a double diaphragm sign where you can see there is one outline of the diaphragm, another outline of the diaphragm, and there is air under the diaphragm here. So air under the diaphragm on both sides here, there is perforation to the viscera. So sometimes they may give you this x-ray and ask you what you see on the x-ray and what exactly is going to be a definitive management. So this patient needs to be taken to theatre. You need to perform an emergency explorative laparotomy because this patient's bowel has perforated somewhere. Question two, a patient is brought to the emergency department with an absent pulse and a blood pressure of 80 over 60. What is your diagnosis? How would you manage this patient? You may pause the video and I hope you are keeping score of whatever you are writing and whatever you are doing. And here comes the answer. So obviously this patient is in shock. We don't have enough information to actually tell us whether this patient is either in hypovolemic shock or hemorrhagic shock. But generally this patient is in shock because their systolic blood pressure is less than 90, their diastolic blood pressure is at the benchmark which is 60. So generally how we're going to be managing this patient, we want to do our primary survey first. So we do your ABCs, we check that the airway is patent, check for any secretions, suction, any secretions that may be present, check that this patient is breathing. You may even want to check the oxygen saturation of this patient. If the saturations are less than 90%, then we want to put this patient on oxygen. You can escalate the oxygen accordingly from your nasal prongs to your simple face mask, your venturi mask, your non rebreather mask, or your non rebreather plus your uh, simple uh, nasal prongs. Then after I've started this patient on oxygen, we gain venous access with two large bowl cannulae, though I've never seen this being done with, uh, of course, the gray cannula. Two large bowl cannulae, which is about 14G cannulae. 
you draw blood for investigations, you make sure that you get a full blood count, you get a cross match because this patient may need to be actually transfused. So you start running your IV fluids as well. Your fluid of choice in this case is going to be Ringer's lactate. But of course, that's also largely depends on the cause of the shock and why the patient is on shock. Then you check if this patient is bleeding from anywhere. You may check, expose the patient all over, check that there are no bruises, there are no active points of bleeding. If there are active points of bleeding, you compress them, you suture them if you can. If you can't suture them, you can't compress them, you take, you rush them to theater. Then, of course, check their blood glucose if they're hypoglycemic, give them your bolus of your 50, 30 mils of 50% dextrose, because I assume this isn't an adult. Then, after you have now stabilized the patient, and if they need be, the HP is low and you need to transfuse this patient, then you transfuse this patient. After you have stabilized them, you take now your history, you examine this patient fully, and then you determine the underlying cause of the shock, and then you address the underlying cause of the shock. Of course, if it's a pelvic fracture, it means that this patient needs to actually go to theater. And the fractures that way you can lose a lot of blood include the pelvic fractures, you tend to lose a lot of blood you also tend to lose a lot of blood with the femur fractures. So make sure that you look out for those. If you do a, a pelvic compression test and the patient is screaming in pain, and if they have blood around the tip of the urethra, this may give you some indication that this patient may actually have a pelvic fracture. So what you can do best for them is actually wrap a bed sheet around their pelvis and wrap it quite tight so that they can actually, you can actually create a sort of tamponade to prevent the bleeding. Coming to question three, what is shown on the x-ray? What is your diagnosis? How many fluid levels are normally seen on an x-ray? And what view is this x-ray taken in? You may pause the video. And here comes the answer. So these are air fluid levels. So as you can see, you can see that like as if there's a dark area here, there's a line that's demarcating, another line here with a dark area on top. This is of course bow. There's a line there and there's bow over there. So these are known as air fluid levels. What we can see on this is that there are multiple air fluid levels. Remember that normally you should have less than two air fluid levels on the x-ray. So this person has three, so they have bow obstruction. So the diagnosis here is most likely intestinal obstruction. And remember that you should be able to distinguish between small bow and large bow on x-ray. Remember that small bow tends to be central, large bow tends to be on the periphery. Small bowel tends to have these lines that are traversing the entire lumen of the bowel, which are known as valvulae conventes, or you can call them as valves of cacrine, or you can call them as plica secularis. While the large bowel tends to have the hostrations, which do not traverse the entire lumen. Generally, also the small bowel is found in the central area and may give you a coiled spring appearance, while the large bowel can give you like a frame type of appearance. Then of course, this is an erect x-ray. Remember, we don't see air fluid levels on a supine x-ray. All we see on the supine x-ray is the distended loops of bowel. Question four, what is GCS? How do you score it? I remember when I was in my surgical rotation where my boss actually chased a group of students that uh, didn't know about the GCS. So this is actually a very important thing that they actually do tend to ask on the exam. So remember that the GCS also in full with the Glasgow Coma Scale is actually a clinical tool that's going to be used to assess the level of consciousness. It has three parameters, which are namely eye-opening response, verbal response, and motor response. Eye is scored out of four, verbal is scored out of five, Motor is scored out of six, meaning that the maximum score that you can get is a 15 out of 15. The lowest score you can get is a three out of 15. So you can never score below three. So you give them a score of four out of four if they're able to open their eyes spontaneously. You give them a score of three if they're able to open in response to verbal, if you call their name out. You give them a score of two if they open in response to pain. For example, rubbing their sternum, rubbing the upper eyebrow. Then if there's no response at all, you give them a score of one. For the verbal response, you give them a score of five if they're, yeah, they're oriented and they can converse with you. They're oriented in time, place, and person. They know where they are, they know who they are, and they know the time of day that it is. If they're disoriented but confused, but they're communicating coherently, you give them a score of four. If they're giving you inappropriate responses, intelligible single words, things that are not really answering the question, but you can understand what they're saying, you give them a score of three. If they're making in inappropriate sounds or incomprehensible sounds like moans and groans, you give them a score of two. If there's no response at all, you give them a score of one. 
Then for motor response, six if you're able to obey simple commands, for example, lift your hand up, put it down, lift your foot up, put it down. Five if they're able to localize pain, so they bring the hands above the clavicle to any stimulus that is applied on the head or the neck. Four, if they withdraw to pain, so they bend their arms at the elbow rapidly, but the features are not really predominantly abnormal. Then three, if they're in the decorticate positioning, what I like to call the mummy position. You know how mummies are positioned in the tomb where their arms are bent and their elbows are flexed, like as if a mummy is in a tomb with their, eye, with their arms crossed over their chest. Then decerebrate is where all the arms and the legs are extended, which you give them a score of two. One, if there's no response at all. So remember that this is actually used especially to determine head injury, especially in surgery. So someone with a GCS of 13, 14, 15, it's mild head injury, 9, 10, 11, 12, moderate head injury, 8, 5, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, that's severe brain injury. Anyone less than 8 will actually be comatose. Coming to the last question of chapter 2. A patient is, I don't know how I've given you the answer, a patient is involved in an RTA and an x-ray is taken and uh, what show what is shown. So remember, this is a right-sided meniscus sign. As you can see, this looks like a meniscus. It's like when you put water in a cup, right-sided meniscus sign, and you also have a right lower zone opacity. So this is most likely a hemothorax if you put the history into perspective that this person was involved in a road traffic accident and they had got an x-ray and this is what the x-ray showed. So how would you manage this people? Primary survey. So you do your ABCs, your airway, your breathing, your circulation. You had the definitive management is of course with the intercostal chest drain. Here is a picture of what a hemoneumothorax or a pneumohemothorax rather would look like. As you can see here, part of the lung this is the outline of the lung. So part of the lung has collapsed. You have you don't have any lung markings here in the peripheral aspects. And you can see that there's fluid also over there accumulated at the bottom. Moving on to chapter three, which is pediatrics. Question one, how do you classify malnutrition? What are the steps of management? Okay, so it's never really an exam if you don't ask about malnutrition in pediatrics. So remember that malnutrition, when they talk about malnutrition, they're actually talking about undernutrition. First of all, the broader aspect of the classification is going to divide them into overnutrition, which are those children that are obese, undernutrition, which are those children that, are, that they have lack of micro and macronutrients. Then actually undernutrition, which is also referred to as a protein energy malnutrition, is divided into different types. So you have the WHO classification, which uses the weight for height Z scores. We have the MUAC as well as the presence of bipedal edema. I've done a video on malnutrition. You may just actually check it out in the pediatric playlist. Then of course you can use the basic groupings, the anthropometric measurements. So if your child is low weight for height, we say that they're wasted. If they are low height for age, we say that they are stunted. If they have low weight for age, we say that they are underweight. We can also use the water low classification, which uses weight for height. We can use the Gomez classification, which uses the weight for age. We can use the welcome classification, which uses the weight for age. So here is the Waterloo classification, which uses the weight for height or the height for age. So the weight for height, if it's 90 to 80 to 90 of the expected, you call that as mild malnutrition. 70 to 80, moderate malnutrition. Less than 70, that's severe malnutrition. Using the Gomez classification, if someone is over 90% of the normal weight for age, that's normal. If they're 76 to 90, that's mild malnutrition. If they're 61 to 75, moderate malnutrition. Less than 60, severe malnutrition. Then, of course, the welcome classification, which is the one that commonly what they'll ask you about if they are between 60 to 80 percent of the expected weight if they have edema it's kwashiorkor if they don't have edema it's undernutrition if it's less than 60 percent if they have edema it's marasmic kwashiorkor if they don't have edema it's marasmus so what are the 10 steps of management that we are actually looking at so if you look at some of the books they'll give you the 10 steps in two phases a stabilization phase and a rehabilitation phase. If you read other literature, they'll give you three phases, a stabilization phase, which is usually the first two days, a transition phase, which is usually between three to seven days, and the rehabilitation phase, which takes about two to six weeks. So we want to treat and prevent hypoglycemia, treat and prevent hypothermia, treat and prevent dehydration, prevent electrolyte imbalances, prevent infections. 
And of course, these are the five things that can kill the child in the first 24 hours. Then you want to give micronutrients. Remember, we don't give iron in the first week, then we give iron in the next week. We initiate the feeds with F75, which is a low calorie feed. Why are we using F75? We want to prevent refeeding syndrome. Then we give the catch-up feeds, which is F100. Remember that when a child is on F75, you don't expect them to gain weight. You expect them to gain weight when they are on the F100. Then, of course, sensory stimulation is very important throughout the entire process, and then we prepare them for discharge and follow-up. These are the 10 steps that we often use. The details of this, I actually talk about them in my malnutrition video, so you can actually check that out in the playlist. Question two. It's never really a pediatric exam again if you don't have dehydration. So question one, how do you classify dehydration? What would you, well, how would you manage some and severe dehydration? You may pause the video right now and here comes the answer. So we classify dehydration into three main groups. No dehydration meaning that they have no sign of dehydration. Some dehydration meaning that they have two or more of the following things. They may have a sunken anterior fontanelle if they are appropriately for age, if their anterior fontanelle is too open. You may have sunken eyes. You may have uh, eagerness to drink the, the breast milk or eagerness to drink fluids. And then you may have delayed skin turgor. You may have delayed capillary refill time. Then severe dehydration, they are often lethargic. They're unable to drink. They have sunken eyes, very, very sunken eyes, depressed fontanelles. You may even have tachycardia. They may have been unable to pass any urine, a delayed capillary refill time, and a delayed skin turgor or a poor skin turgor. So how would you manage some and severe dehydration? So we'll start with some dehydration. This, I think I just gave for severe dehydration. So for some dehydration, we give 75 mils per kg of ring of ORS. Remember some dehydration you give ORS of ORS over four hours. So for example, if a child is weighing 10 kg over four hours, they need to receive about 750 mils of ORS. And if it's severe dehydration, which is what is depicted on the screen right now, you give 100 mils per kg. This is IV of Ringer's lactate or half strength diarrhea solution, or you can give normal saline if those two are not available. If it's a child that's less than one year, we give the fluids over six hours. So the 30 mils per kg in the first hour, 70 mils per kg in the next five hours to prevent fluid overload. If the child is above one year, but between one year to five years, we give 30 mils per kg in the first 30 minutes, 70 mils per kg in the next two and a half hours. Then of course we reassess this child every 15 minutes and then after the either the six hours or the three hours, we reassess them and we reclassify their hydration status. If they are out of the hydration, if they are out of the dehydration and they are now in some dehydration, you now give them the 75 mils per kg. If there's no dehydration, 10 mils per kg per loose stool. Then of course, if the child can drink, as as soon as they can drink, you and they are out of the completely out of the dehydration you encourage them to drink as much as possible then of course we can give them zinc sulfate if they're less than six months we give them 10 milligrams um, of zinc sulfate once a day for about 10 to 14 days and if they're above six months we give them 20 milligrams of zinc sulfate for 10 to 14 days question three what are some of the causes of diarrhea what is the most common cause of diarrhea of dehydration what is the most common cause of diarrhea what are some complications of diarrhea? You may pause the video right now, and here comes the answer. So, mostly are uh, due to infectious causes. So, these are going to be including viruses, bacteria, and parasites. Then the non-infectious things are often related to things like feeds. For example, if someone is being fed on a formula milk and it's made either too dilute or too concentrated, you may have certain drugs like antibiotics that can cause diarrhea, even certain allergies. You may have things like lactose intolerance you may have things like uh, celiac disease or your malabsorptive syndromes which can also cause diarrhea so the infectious causes can be divided into viruses rotavirus which is by far one of the most common cause of diarrhea in children no work virus you may have cytomegalovirus enteric adenoviruses astroviruses coronaviruses picornaviruses human caliciviruses hiv bacteria you have those that uh, produce diarrhea uh, which is due to inflammatory type of diarrhea. We have Campylobacter jejuni, Clostridium difficile, Clostridium perfringens, Enterinvasive E. coli, E. coli, which is that strain O157H7, then Salmonella, you may have Shigella, Yersinia enter enterocolitica, Vibrio parahemolyticus. Now, the ones that have put asterisks on, these are the ones that cause bloody diarrhea.
then you may have bacteria that are producing non-inflammatory type of diarrhea, the enterotoxigenic E. coli, the Vibrio cholerae, the O1 and the O139 strains, the enteropathogenic E. coli, the Vibrio, choler Vibrio parahemolyticus, as well as Staphylococcus aureus. Then you may also have parasites such as Jardia lamblia, Cryptosporidium pavum, Entamoeba histolytica, Cyclospora, as well as Isospora belly. So what is the most common cause of dehydration? Of course, it's diarrhea. And the most common cause of diarrhea is the infectious causes, which in our setup is the rotavirus. But worldwide, actually, E. coli is the most common cause of diarrhea. Then some of the acute complications are going to be including things like dehydration, electrolyte imbalance, septicemia, which is often attributed to infectious diarrhea. You may also have recurrent episodes of diarrhea leading to malnutrition. Coming to question four, what is the difference between rheumatic fever and rheumatic heart disease? What is the Jones criteria? Which is the least common major? You may pause the video and here comes the answer. So remember that rheumatic heart disease is often a sequelae or complications of rheumatic fever. Rheumatic fever is a complication of post streptococcal infection, which is pretty much your Lansfield group A beta hemolytic streptococcus. Now the Jones criteria divides is actually a diagnostic criteria which is used to make a diagnosis of rheumatic fever. It's actually for you to make a diagnosis, number one, you actually have to have a proven um, focus of the organism. So you should have markedly risen anti-streptolysin O titers or other streptococcal antibodies or group A streptococcus on the throat cultures. So a proven source of the infection plus, of course, two majors and one minor or one major, two minors. Then what are the majors? So the majors are pericarditis, which is seen in 50% of the cases. Polyarthritis, which is the most common seen in 80% of the cases. Sydenham's chorea, which is seen in 10% of the cases. Erythema marginatum, which is seen in less than 5. And subcutaneous nodules, which are quite rare. The minor manifestations are things like fever, polyarthralgia. Remember, this is different from this polyarthritis. The polyarthritis here is migratory in type. So migratory polyarthritis, polyarthralgia is just joint pain. Then you have a history of rheumatic fever, a raised acute phase reactants like ESR and C-reactive protein and leukocytosis, and a prolonged PR interval on the ECG. So the least common major is actually subcutaneous nodules. What is the under five card? Tell me about the immunization schedule. What is in the pentavalent vaccine? Why do we give rotor vaccine? You may pause the video. This is the last question on pediatric chapter. And here comes the answer. So remember what is on the under five card. We have number one, the growth chart, which is pretty much what you're going to be using to plot the weight of the child versus the age of the child. On there, we also have the, the, a table that is showing you the developmental milestones, the age that the child is supposed to attain certain developmental milestones and when the mother should be worried. It also has the different types of foods that the mother should actually feed the child. It has also a section of prevention of mother to child transmission where you can actually indicate whether the child is exposed or the child is not exposed. If they're exposed, the, when the test, the appropriate tests are done, the age at which the tests are done and the results of the test, the HIV tests that are being done in this child. We also have an area where you have the demographics, the name of the child, the name of the parents. And then, of course, you have a section where you have the immunization schedule where you actually fill in the details of the vaccines that were given at the appropriate age. So now the immunization schedule is as follows. So, of course, at birth, we're going to be giving our BCG. We can give this at birth or within uh, 14 days. Then OPV0 is also given. If you don't give OPV0, that means you're going to give OPV4. Then the next set of vaccines are going to be given at six weeks. So we give our OPV1, oral polio vaccine 1, and we also give our DPT hip herb 1, which is at six weeks. Then at the next four weeks later, which is at 10 weeks, you give our OPV2, and we also give a DPT hip herb uh, 2. And then at, three, at 14 weeks, we give our OPV3, and actually the IPV should, should be given at at OPV2. Then at, we give OPV3 at 14 weeks together with the DPT hip heb 3. Then of course at nine months if they haven't received, they had not received the OPV0, you can give the OPV4. Then PCV1 is given at six weeks, uh, PCV2 is given at 
10 weeks, PCV3 is given at 14 weeks. Rota vaccine is given at 6 weeks. That's the one. Rota vaccine 2 is given at 10 weeks. Measles and rubella are given at 9 months. And then the next dose is given at 18 months. So that's generally a rough indication of the immunization schedule. Then the pentavalent vaccine is going to be consisting of diphtheria, pertussis, tetanus, hepatitis B, and haemophilus influenza type B. So five different organisms that you're vaccinating against. The reason why we give vaccine for rota is because we want to reduce the incidence of diarrhea. And remember that we say that rotavirus is the most common cause of diarrhea in our setting in children. So that's why we do vaccinate against it. Moving on to the last chapter, which is obstetrics and gynecology. Question one, a woman comes with a history of amenorrhea. What is a differential diagnosis? How do you manage ectopic pregnancy? You may pause the video at this moment and here comes the answer. So remember that here, the differential diagnosis largely depends on the hypothalamic pituitary ovarian axis. So remember, this is what's going to be governing the menstrual cycle. So it could be problems in the hypothalamus. It could be problems in the pituitary gland. It could be problems in the ovaries themselves. It could even be problems in the uterus. So remember that when you talk about amenorrhea, are you really talking about primary amenorrhea? Are you talking about secondary amenorrhea? Remember with primary amenorrhea, this is absence of menses in a child that is age 16 with normal growth and development of secondary sexual characteristics or the absence of menses in a girl that's aged 14 with no growth or secondary sexual characteristics. So this person has never had menses before. Then secondary amenorrhea, they have had menses, so it's the absence of menses for a duration of six months or more in a woman that has attained menarche. Then these causes can be divided into, of course, the hypothalamic, the, the primary, the, there are different causes for primary and the different causes for secondary. For primary, suppose the child has breasts that are present and the uterus is present. You're thinking maybe things like abnormalities like the vaginal agenesis, vaginal septum. You may also have imperforate hymen. If the breasts are present but the uterus is absent, you're thinking of things like malaria and agenesis, which is your Meyer Rokitansky Kusterhauser syndrome. You may also think about your androgen insensitivity, that's your testicular feminization, which is the 46XY. If the breast is absent but the uterus is present, it could be gonadodysgenesis, that's your Turner syndrome, or your HPO axis failure, which is your Kalman syndrome. Here is a, a much more detailed list of the different other types of causes and examples that you get. Different types of causes and examples that you get for primary amenorrhea. And then with secondary amenorrhea, most common cause, of course, it could be pregnant, that this woman is pregnant. You could have the pituitary causes like a prolactinoma, Sheehan syndrome. You could have ovarian causes like a uh, primary ovarian failure as well as polycystic ovarian syndrome uterine causes such as asherman syndrome endometrial ablation endometritis tb of the endometrium cervical stenosis endocrine causes like acromegaly cushion's disease hypothyroidism hyperthyroidism and diabetes mellitus coming back to the second Cause how do you manage an ectopic pregnancy? Generally ABCs. Remember, this is an emergency. So you gain venous access, ensure that the patient is breathing, give them oxygen if they are desaturating, and then of course ensure that the airway is clear. Medical therapy for those that are unruptured ectopic pregnancies. So when they give methotrexy, there's a certain criteria which patients have to follow. If it's ruptured, then surgical therapy. Remember that surgical therapy is usually our go-to mainstay man management in our case. So you can do this either by an emergency laparotomy, which is what we do, or you can do laparoscopic procedure for those that are unruptured. So here's a schematic of the management. So let's just go through it real quick. So here we have a female who has a positive urine HCG level, low abdominal pain and vaginal bleeding. So we take our history. Are, is this patient hemodynamically stable? Are they not hemodynamically stable? If they're hemodynamically unstable, it means that you will assume that it has ruptured or they are continuously bleeding. So immediately this patient needs to be taken for surgery. If they are stable, then you want to do some further tests. Of course, if the ectopic pregnancy is identified, so you see the yolk sac, you see the fetal pole, the cardiac activity, you treat as an ectopic pregnancy. So the other non-diagnostic things that you may want to do is you want to do a quantitative uh, serum beta ACG levels if they're greater than 1,500 milli international units or greater than 1,500 international units per liter, then of course this 
is suspicious and there's a suspicious mass in the adnexa you may manage them medically if it's unruptured or surgically if it's ruptured if there's no adnexal mass and there's no intrauterine sac identified you repeat the beta hcg and the transvaginal sonography in about two days if there's no intrauterine pregnancy and the hcg levels are decreasing then this is a failed pregnancy if the hcg levels have plateaued you treat medically or surgically as an ectopic pregnancy on the other end of the spectrum if the beta ECG is less than 1,500, we we'll repeat after 72 hours. Then, of course, if the ECG plateaus uh, or is suboptimal, less than double, we do a transvaginal sonography. Then if there's an intrauterine pregnancy, continue the pregnancy. If there's an adnexal mass, you manage as an ectopic pregnancy. If it's negative, this is an ectopic pregnancy or a failed intrauterine pregnancy. And, of course, a medical or surgical therapy is indicated in that case. Then, of course, this is a treatment algorithm and how we're going to be investigating we're testing for suspected ectopic pregnancy but largely the definitive treatment is either medical treatment where you actually give them methotrexate or surgical treatment where you actually take them for exploratory laparotomy or you can do a laparoscopic approach question two what are the most common malignancies in zambia how do you screen how would you screen for cervical cancer so the common malignancies in zambia include cervical cancer breast cancer liver cancer, prostate cancer in men, of course, Kaposi sarcoma. We often treat for, or we often screen for cervical cancer using visual inspection under acetic acid, which is vinegar, colposcopy, plus or minus a biopsy. We can use a Schiller's test, which uses iodine, a pap smear, as well as HPV DNA testing. Question three, what is oligohydramnios? What are the causes? How would you manage a patient that presents with premature rupture of membranes? What are the complications of premature rupture of membranes? What is the most feared complication of premature rupture of membranes? You may pause the video and here comes the answer. So remember oligohydramnios is pretty much number one, a lack of amniotic fluid, less than 200 mils at term or amniotic fluid index that's less than five centimeters. Remember that the normal amniotic fluid index is about five to 25 centimeters. A single deepest pool that's less than two centimeters. Normally it's between 2.1 to eight centimeters at a gestational age between 28 to 40 weeks. Causes are going to be including fetal causes, placental causes or maternal causes. Fetal causes may include um, premature rupture of membranes, which is the most common cause as the membrane ruptures they continue to drain then you may have structural or chromosomal defects you may have bilateral renal agenesis you may also have a fetal obstructive uropathies you may have intrauterine infections drugs such as enalapril remember these are going to be inhibiting the breakdown of bradykinins which affects the kidneys as well as the uh, uh, prostaglandin inhibitors then you also have post maturity as the child is past the date of delivery and they're still in the uterus, the, the amniotic fluid level begins to reduce. Then you also have intrauterine growth restriction. And the placental causes may include things like amnion nodosum. Maternal causes may be hypertensive disorders of pregnancy, uterine placental insufficiency, dehydration, and idiopathic causes where the cause is not really known. So how do we manage a patient that presents with a ruptured, uh, premature rupture of membrane? So here's the management schematic. So Pretty much we assess the maternal health, we check for the fetal gestational age, the weight, the pulmonary maturity, we do a septic workup, so we check for any cervical swabs, urine culture, we perform an unstressed test, a biophysical profile. So generally we want to monitor the maternal pulse, the temperature, the fetal heart rate, and we start them on prophylactic antibiotics plus uh, your beta methasone too, which is a corticosteroid to help mature the lungs. So we assess in terms of amnionitis, we assess for any placenta abruption, we assess for any fetal distress or any labor processes. If these are present, we expedite the delivery. So we give them intrapartum antibiotics, broad spectrum, the child should be admitted to the NICU. If the, these things are not absent, if the pregnancy is less than 34 weeks, it's conservative management. So bed rest, antenatal corticosteroids, broad spectrum antibiotics, we serial evaluations, and then we make consider delivering them at 34 weeks if they're between 34 weeks to 37 weeks we wait for spontaneous onset of the labor for 24 to 48 hours if this fails we induce labor with oxytocin if there's contraindication we perform a cesarean section then if it's above 37 weeks we wait for spontaneous labor to happen within 24 hours if it doesn't happen we induce the labor and um, if they do not have any contraindications for vagina, if they do have contraindications for vaginal delivery, we deliver them via C-section. And then what is the most, what are the complications of premature rupture of membranes? So complications can be divided if the fetus remains in utero, 
and if uh, the preterm delivery occurs. So if the fetus remains in utero, neonatal complications include infections, sepsis, deformations, malpresentation, cord prolapse and umbilical cord compression, fetal pulmonary hypoplasia, especially in preterm uh, premature rupture of membranes, placenta abruption. Maternal complications include chorioamnionitis, sepsis, deep venous thrombosis, and psychosocial separation of the mother. Then, of course, if the preterm delivery occurs, there are complications associated with prematurity. That's a respiratory uh, distress syndrome, which is the most common patent ductus atriosus, intraventricular hemorrhage, necrotizing enterocolitis, retinopathy of prematurity, bronchopulmonary dysplasia, and even cerebral palsy in the long run. The most feared complication is, of course, our cord prolapse. Coming to question four, Doc, let's talk about oxytocin. What is it? Is it a carbohydrate? Is it a protein? Is it a lipid? Where is it produced? What are the uses and complications of its use? What is the half-life of oxytocin? What is the dosage? You may pause the video and here comes the answer. So remember that oxytocin is a protein. It's a known peptide. It consists of nine amino acids. It's a hormone. It's going to be produced from the paraventricular and the supraoptic nucleus of the hypothalamus. Many people make the mistake and say it's produced from the posterior pituitary gland. It's not. It's released from the posterior pituitary gland. Some of the uses include induction of labor, active management of the third stage of labor to prevent complications like postpartum hemorrhage, management of postpartum hemorrhage in abortions such as incomplete, inevitable or missed abortions. Complications include uterine rupture, fetal distress, hypotension, anaphylactoid reactions, arrhythmias. The half-life of oxytocin is three to five minutes when it's given IV and about two hours when it's given intranasally. And of course, the dose depends on the indication. Generally, for active management of the third stage of labor, we often tend to give 10 international units. Then question five, what is labor? What are the stages of labor? What is active management of the third stage of labor? This is indeed the final question. Here comes the answer. So labor is just pretty much a series of events that is going to be leading to regular uterine contractions that bring about progressive effacement, dilatation of the cervix, fetal descent, which is going to be resulting in, of course, expulsion of the fetus, along with the placenta and fetal membranes. It's divided into predominantly three stages. Some books will tell you that there are even four stages. Stage one is known as the cervical stage, which is from the onset of the true labor pains to full dilatation, which is 10 centimeters. It's divided into two phases, the latent phase and the active phase. Then stage, remember we open the pathograph at the active phase of labor. Then stage two is from the dilatation, fully dilated cervix, not from the rupture of membranes, but when the first cervix is fully dilated and it ends with the expulsion of the fetus from the breath canal. It's also divided into two phases, a propulsive phase and expulsive phase. Stage three is where it, it's the delivery of the placenta, so which is in the membranes, which is pretty much from the expulsion of the fetus and ends with the expulsion of the placenta in the membranes, which are known as the afterbirth. Then in stage four, which is pretty much a stage of observation, which is at least one hour after expulsions of the afterbirth, where you actually monitor the, the child and you monitor the mother. Then of course, active management of third stage of labor is where we use these prophylactic measures to actually cause the uterus to contract, where we can actually give some uterotonic administration, such as oxytocin, ergometrin. Then, of course, we perform early cord clamping as well as controlled cord traction during the third stage of labor in an attempt to prevent complications such as postpartum hemorrhage. Remember the big, big difference between active management of labor and the passive or the just the usual management of third stage of labor? It's oxytocin, the drug oxytocin. It makes a huge, huge difference. I really hope you enjoyed this episode of the Atomic Bomb and you helped, it helped you revise so many things. If it did, please hit the like button, hit the subscribe button if you haven't. Hit the bell notification icon to be receiving notifications of such amazing content every time I post. To Zambia and beyond, my name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. Until next time, bye-bye.